really good to be here to be able to speak this morning, particularly as Josh last week really kicked off the next part of this series. And the idea of the series, overwhelmingly, is that we would just stop and look at Jesus, that we would stare at Him, that we would take in more of Him, growing our understanding of Him, look deeply at Him and grow in our devotion to Him. And so last week, Josh spoke about the fact that Jesus is the cornerstone. He's connected us together. We are leaning on Him as the cornerstone. We, each of us being made into a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, a holy temple in the Lord, and members of His household, leaning on that cornerstone that is Jesus. If you haven't heard it, then go back to our YouTube channel and take a look. And so that was about how we corporately together are leaning, are connected to Jesus. This morning, I want us to look at how each of us individually are connected in that way, what that connection looks like, and what the fruit of that connection may be. Uh, Jesus, in uh, John chapter 15, calls himself the true vine. And what we looked like to connect to him as individuals, we'll see in that chapter as we read through it in a few minutes. Firstly, a little bit of context. The events that happen around John chapter 15 are really, really important to help us understand what Jesus was saying and maybe to shine a little bit of a light on why he was saying it. So John chapter 15 takes place at the Last Supper, the day before that first Good Friday. And what's happened a few chapters before is that Judas Iscariot has left the table to betray Jesus. He calls him out. Jesus says, I know what you are about to do. He knows what is going through Jesus' mind as he sits there at the table with all of his friends. And all of the other disciples are seeing this play out in front of them. They don't have the insight that Jesus has. They don't have the ability to see the thoughts that Judas is having before they're even on his lips. But they have the ability to see that this man that they had journeyed with for so long is on a path that none of them could have thought of. Fear and confusion grows, no doubt, within them, in their hearts, in their minds. And so what we see over the the chapters around about John chapter 14 and John chapter 15 and then on into John chapter 16 is Jesus comforting the disciples because what's happened is dreadful. He uses His words to comfort them. He uses his words to reassure them of how God is in full control, irrespective of what it may look like. He uses his words to assure them that his going away is for them going to be a blessing. Why? Because as he says at the end of John chapter 15 and on into John chapter 16, the Holy Spirit will be sent when He goes. Power will come, and they will be set for a greater ministry than they have ever known. Part of that comforting and reassurance is the passage in John chapter 15, where Jesus calls Himself the true vine, and He calls God the Father, the gardener. And we're going to walk through that in a little while. Just to look at some wider context, really helpfully, elsewhere in the Gospels, Jesus uses parables about planting and growing crops of fruit to describe man's relationship to God. In Luke chapter 8, Jesus tells a story about a farmer 
who sows seed on his land, and the seed lands, as he scatters it, on different grounds. One of the grounds is rocky, one of the grounds is thorny, and the other is good soil. And as Jesus describes and explains that parable in Luke chapter 8 his, uh, to his disciples, he says that the seed sown, that seed scattered, is the Word of God, and that the different grounds that receive it are different people receiving the Word. So we're going to unpack that slightly so that we have a better understanding of John chapter 15. You'll see a really uh, nicely done diagram there. I didn't do it. Thanks, Meg. So firstly, the rocky ground. This rocky ground means that the word is received, Jesus says, with great joy, but there's no root grown. So it does not endure. It does not last. Jesus says in his explanation, these people believe for a while, but in the time of testing, they fall away. I want to suggest this morning that we call this nominalism in the life of uh, somebody who comes and hears the Word of God. A follower of Jesus by name, but not by nature. Something has changed on the outside, but not where it matters. There's no grounding. It remains superficial with just the outward appearance of life, and it's short-lived. Secondly, we have the thorny ground. This means, again, that the Word of God is received, but as they go on their way into life, they're choked by life's worries, life's riches, and pleasures. Jesus says, they do not grow to fruit. I want to suggest again this morning that we call this worldliness. The seed scattered and planted has the potential to grow, but the heart and the mind are polluted with other things that aren't sufficient environments to sustain the life of the Word of God in the life of the Christian. No fruit real fruit, godly fruit, is produced. And that final soil is the good soil, meaning that the Word is received joyfully, is well-rooted, finds good moisture, and therefore, Jesus says, yields a strong crop. Jesus, describing these people, says that they are those with a noble and a good heart, who hear the word, they, return, they, they retain it, and by persevering, they produce a good crop. So that's a little bit of background for us as we jump straight in to John chapter 15, beginning at verse 1. And you'll see different sections of verses that will come up on the screen as I read through them, and then we just chat through what some of those things mean. Start at verse 1, I am the true vine, my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes, so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. We've already said, these disciples that are sat there listening to what Jesus has to say, being comforted and challenged and spurred on by His words, have just seen one of their number effectively be cut off, left the table on a path to, do, to betray the one that they loved. He's persuaded by His passion for money his desire to get money no matter what. And that really is the fruit that we see right the way through the account of Judas' life with Jesus. A love for money, a prioritizing of money, and a desire to get money to himself 
no matter what it takes. Not only here in the Last Supper, but actually at various other times, and particularly in John chapter 12. It says in John chapter 12 that Jesus was eating with a crowd in Simon's home. And a woman had come, this woman was Mary, who's the sister of Martha. She'd come to anoint Jesus with a perfume and to show her worship and to show her devotion of him. And it says in John chapter 12, one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, objected to what Mary had done. Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages. And then John, just in case we think there's something noble about Judas' motivation, John writes and says, he did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. Wow. That is the fruit that was coming out, that was present, growing out of Judas' life, not just there in the Last Supper, but throughout his ministry with Jesus. John goes on and says, as keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put in it. John had the benefit of seeing the whole fruit of Judas as he wrote. We go on in John, in John chapter 15 from verse 4. Jesus says, Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain within the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, and you are the branches. If you remain in me, and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up and thrown into the fire and burnt. If you remain in me, and my words remain in you, Ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. Remaining in Jesus and having him remain in them was essential for their fruitfulness as disciples, that they would leave that table having heard this, and what would be deep within them is this desire not to be cut off, not to leave him, not to estrange themselves from him. It was essential in order that their fruit, the fruit of their discipleship, would be what Jesus desired. Or the alternative would be that they would bear the kind of fruit that Jesus would not have had them grow. Or to just grow nothing at all. In fact, Jesus says that apart from him, they can do nothing at all. They're useless without him. After these disciples had seen the attitude and the actions of Judas, they're just beginning to see what it looks like to not remain in him. There he is, cut off. And over the next few days, they will ultimately see that his absolute desire for a full pocket overwhelmingly outweighed his desire to love the one who had chosen him. Judas' nominalism or worldliness has meant that the word in his experience did not produce good fruit, and so he was removed. On from verse 8, it says, This is to my Father's glory, that you would bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands, and I remain in his love. 
I have told you this so that you, so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be made complete. Those disciples hearing these words, bearing fruit, becoming more and more like Jesus in their thoughts, in their words, in their deeds, was to the glory of God. It brings God great glory when a disciple is fruitful for Him. There is something in the life of a disciple that means that when our lives, when our thoughts, when our actions, when our words produce great fruit, when we become more and more like Jesus, that glorifies the Father in such a way. And these disciples were hearing it firsthand. When we are hearers and doers of the, His Word, our lives produce the sort of fruit that comes from being all in, truly connected to the true vine, remaining in Him and glorifying God. And we really have to be careful with fruitfulness. Now, you may have been at churches, you may have been at meetings that tell you that fruitfulness is about the number of people that you bring to Christ, or it's about the amount of religious duty that you do, or it's about how many boxes you tick on your spiritual checklist. That isn't at all what Jesus is teaching. And that isn't what the weight of New, Testament te uh, of New Testament Scripture teaches. Actually, that fruitfulness is about daily you and I who are in relationship with Jesus becoming more and more like Him in the way that we think and in the way that we speak and in the way that we act. Now, what flows out of those things is witnessing to others so that they would come and know Jesus. It is doing some of those things that others would regard as religious duty, in inverted commas. It is a desire to get deep into His Word, and so daily you are reading Scripture. It is a desire to come and to gather together with other brothers and sisters and to worship Him, because you are connected to the vine in such a way that the fruit that is beginning to develop inside you is a desire to be more and more like Him. Jesus right here on this most difficult of nights is so concerned for his disciples and their remaining in him in the face of trial to come that he uses this time, this time where he could have been cowering in the corner, this time where he could have been, get away from me, I need some time to think about what is ahead, but instead he uses it to fill them with joy. Fill them with joy in the midst of despair and the best kind of joy. He didn't remove what was happening or what was around the corner. It's not that kind of joy. It's not the kind of joy that removes all the bad stuff. It's deep joy. What he did was he filled them with joy and encouraged them to continue in Him as their source of joy in the midst of trial. O oh God, that we would hear that in our trials today, that in the midst of difficulty, that in the midst of whatever it is you are going through right now, we would realize that it's okay if he doesn't click his fingers and it all goes away because he has filled you with joy that in the midst of it, you would know him and that your joy would be complete in him, even in the most horrific of situations. Oh God, let our hearts, let our minds, Realize the gift of great joy.
as Jesus goes on from verse 12. He says, my command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. You see, right here, Jesus is speaking to, effectively, a band of brothers, a band of people who he has chosen, who he has gathered around himself, who he has journeyed with, those who have followed him into the most difficult of ministry situations. And Jesus is reminding them to continue to be a united force. That even though it's going to get dark, even though it's going to get difficult, even though the temptation will come to go their separate ways, remain united in love, together in the vine, together connected to the source of perfect love. They've seen one go already. They've seen one follow the desire for a full pocket. Now they must keep knowing the love of Jesus flowing in them, flowing through them as they continue to be his disciples even after he has left them. And Jesus was about to demonstrate his great love for all humanity by obediently laying down his life. But not just for all humanity but for those that he was sat at the table with, for those friends, for those that had touched him, for those that he had touched, for those that he had walked with and talked with and laughed with and wept with and grown a deep connection with. He was going to lay his life down for them. He was going to go to the most painful of death for those that right now were looking at him right in the eyes. And his command to them was, remain in me even after I leave you. As we come just towards the latter uh, verses of this passage from verse 15, It says, I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything that I have learned from my father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you. And I appointed you so that you may go and bear fruit, fruit that will last so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. As an aside, I realized as I was slightly rehearsing this early hours of this morning, that I say fruit different to the rest of you. You say fruit. I say fruit. And it just reminded me then in that verse. Right there and right then, Jesus addresses his disciples as those who had journeyed with him. So intimately, so faithfully, and ultimately they would die knowing that they had to remain in him. They'd become his friends because of their faithful obedience to his command. He was their source of life, and their remaining in him meant that they remained fruitful and glorified God throughout their lives. Jesus had chosen them. He'd chosen them knowing the end from the beginning. He'd chosen them knowing that they would produce fruit in Him. Not just for them, but fruit for eternity. So taking it from there, what does it mean for us as disciples today? What does our remaining in the vine look like today? Is it superficial? 
Does it look good on the outside, but actually inside it's rather corrupt, rather polluted? Does it look like it's alive, but on the inside it is dead? Is it short-lived? Is it swept away by the trials of every day? Jesus encouraged those early disciples and us to be all in, in such a way that every aspect of our lives are conformed to Christ. Every aspect, our social lives, our work lives, our financial lives, our sex lives, every aspect conformed to Him, even those bits that we think are well hidden from others. Very last verse in this passage, John chapter 15 and verse 17, Jesus reminds them, this is my command, love each other. He reminds them, those disciples sat there, that their unity, loving each other, is commanded. It's not an option. They cannot choose to love each other today and to hate each other tomorrow. Their fruitfulness is dependent on remaining in Him, and in order to truly do that, they must follow His command. And so in turn, our unity is vital. Our ability to prefer one another's needs above our own, our desire to care for one another, our, de our determination for His love to flow throughout all we do, all we think, and all we say is essential if we have a desire to be fruitful. Those early disciples were being prepared for the most horrific of situations, as Jesus was to be taken away from them, to tragically die in the most horrific of ways. But someone else was coming. Jesus said it as He comforted them. I am going. He is coming. He was preparing them that though He would go, the Holy Spirit would come. For you and I today, on the back end of that, the Holy Spirit has come. He is here desiring a presence in our lives, an opportunity to daily change us to be more and more like Jesus. That is His desire, to work in and through your life, to conform you daily, more and more like Him. Jesus promised it to those that were sat at that table with Him. We are the recipients of the promise. His Holy Spirit is in us and with us. If we will take up that invitation. Would you stand if you're able and the band can come and join me? There are really some key applications from this passage and from the way that we've unpacked it this morning. And I had a sense as I was preparing that actually this space of around about five to seven minutes is all about each of us individually doing business with God in a way that we've never done business with Him before in peeling back all of the nominalism, all of the worldliness, and saying, God, make a way. God, I want to connect to you. God, I, know, I want to know what it is to be in the true vine in such a way that what flows through it flows through me and out into every context I find myself in. So three applications. If this morning you realize that you outwardly look really fruitful, but inwardly you are just back where you were, 
the nominalism needs to be broken in your life in the name of Jesus. Maybe you came to him a while ago, and since then you've picked up a whole load of habit that have grown in your lives. Maybe this morning the issue is what you watch, what you listen to, and it's growing fruit in your life rather than the fruit of God. This morning, in the name of Jesus, those things need to be broken so that you can know a true connection to the true vine. So that you can grow in the fruit to the glory of God. And so that daily, you can show that you are His disciple by the fruit that you bear. As we sing this song, I want to encourage you, do business with God. If you need to sit, you can sit. If you need to kneel, you can kneel. If you need to lay on the ground, feel free to do that as well. Whatever posture you need to be in, allow God by His Spirit to shift mindsets this morning, to break old ways this morning, to set you a new path for Him. Just as Nigel said, Nigel, I have to say, I wasn't sure I was going to be able to preach because you had me blubbering at the back there. But Nigel is a witness to all of us that the God who sees us in the depths of our struggle is the God who lifts us, puts us in high places, and says, you are mine. Go on. Go on. This morning, let this be the beginning of your journey with him. There will be a prayer team at the end of the service who will gather there, and they would love to pray with you about some of the things that have been brought to mind in your situation this morning. But let's do business with him. Amen.